It is with joy that we bring back Pastor Barry McLaughlin uh, to Westside Baptist Church pulpit. Give him a round of welcome to Westside again. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's always exciting to be here. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for the invite. Anytime I get an opportunity to speak here, I love it. I say that every time, but it never gets old. I look around the room and I love each and every one of you. You guys are such uh, strong Christians in the faith and um, it really encourages me to be a better man in Jesus. So I just want to say thank you. You guys are an inspiration to me personally, but also I think you're changing the world. I really do. And uh, I praise God for men and women like you. And I really sincerely mean that. So welcome. Uh, I, I, you always make me feel so welcome, and I praise God for that. Also, you want to bear with me this morning as I'll be using a PowerPoint, and that'll be interesting how that goes. But first of all, this morning I want to talk about uh, 13 truths. They're actually the greatest truths in the world from the greatest verse in the world in the greatest book in the world, the Bible, John 3.16. Now, you're all familiar with it. But oftentimes we, uh, I want to, what I want to do is I want to look at it uh, and I want to kind of break it down a little bit and what that, that uh, verse really means. And we're going to be really focusing on this one verse this morning. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I don't agree with everything the reformer uh, uh, Martin Luther has said, but I do like what he says in this quote of his about John 3.16. He said, the heart, he said, quote, the heart of the Bible, the gospel in miniature. That's what he thinks of John 3.16, at least, at least I agree with that part. He says it's so simple a child can understand it, yet it condenses the deep and marvelous truths of redemption. And so we see that. But before we can talk about John 3.16, I want to give you a little background in the book. First of all, I'm going to talk to you about the purpose for the book of John. That's found in John chapter 20, verse 31. And I am already forgot to advance it. So, And he did say, if that doesn't work, I do this. Yeah, see? Look at that. Whoop. There. <laughs> There. Okay, hold on. I'm getting there. Okay. So first of all, the purpose. In John 20, verse 31, it says, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So that's the purpose for John. But I want to look at the outline. And you can see up here on the screen the outline. First of all, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18 is a heavenly genealogy. Do you know the other Gospels have genealogies in them? And they, the writers wanted to project a certain thought into the book. Well, here John wants us to know of Jesus' heavenly genealogy, if you will. And then, of course, we see in chapter 1, verse 19 through 11, chapter 11, verse 57, this is his public ministry. There are seven signs that are recorded. Now, I'm sure he did many, and there's seven discourses that re are recorded by John. And then, of course, in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 50, we see the triumphal entry. But this is also the public national rejection of Christ by the Jews. And then chapters 13 through 17 is the upper room discourse. This is new seed truth if you will, truth that was in seed form, that Jesus was about to give the disciples about the new church age. And then, of course, John chapter 18 through 21 are what we call the passion narratives. This is from the crucifixion to the resurrection. Now, this is important to understand because we need to understand the setting. John 3.16 takes place during Jesus' public ministry. John chapter 2 there's this, uh, it says that many people believed when they saw the signs that he did. And I know I'm pushing the wrong one. Okay. 
Okay. All right. So I think, uh, okay, we'll just leave it there. All right. Anyway. Uh, okay. Is that up? Yeah, you're good. I got it. That's up. Okay. But is it up there? Okay. Well, anyway. All right. So I'll carry on. So turn with me to John chapter three. If you're not already there, John chapter three. John chapter three. Verse one. John chapter three, verse one. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. See, Nicodemus recognized there was something different about Jesus, but he was a Pharisee. He was part of the Jerusalem council known as the Sanhedrin. They were the religious ruling class of the Jewish people. Jesus, as a matter of fact, refers to him as the teacher using the definite article. This is implying that Nicodemus should have known or been able to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but he didn't. Now, G Jesus goes on to explain to Nicodemus what he has to do to be saved. He had to break through Nicodemus's preconceived prejudices to get him to understand the gospel message. And that's when he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But how much does God truly love us? Well, the answer, interestingly enough, if, you, if you're looking at John 3, 16, is found in the first two words in the original Greek. It's huto gar. That means thus for. Now, if you look up the Greek, it's actually thus starts out John 3, 16, not for God so loved the world. It's thus for God so loved the world, which means in this way, what it means in the Greek is it means in this way, in this way is how Jesus loves you. In other words, in this way, I'm about to explain to you how much I love you. That's what he's saying. How much God loves you. I'm about to tell you. I'm about to explain to you. So if you've ever wondered, how much does God love me? He's, that's what he's saying there. He's saying, thus for, in this way, I love you. That's what he's saying in John 3.16. John 3.16 has become recognized all around the world. We see behind the goalposts, John 3.16. I know on Saturdays, my son and I used to go out at, on Saturdays at 3.16 and share the gospel. But I want to look more deeply than just a, a, a sign or some kind of gimmick or something else. I'm going to look at 13 truths, and it starts with the first one, which should be up on the board there. And that is, God is the greatest being. For John starts out in 316, for God. See, God is the subject of John 316 and the Bible. God is the foundation of the promise for eternal life. God guarantees the promise of eternal life. God's glory is in the purpose for John 3.16 and the Bible. It is about God's glory. I want to look at some of the attributes of the greatest being, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you know God is the uncaused cause? He is the eternal uncaused cause. As a matter of fact, Psalm 90 says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had made the earth or the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, please. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. This is the... Moses in the wilderness, and he, he is confronted in a, by a theophany, which is a, a manifestation of, of God. Exodus 3, 14 through 15, God is speaking to Moses in the burning bush. He says, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. 
Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. That, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. I want to share this with you for a moment this morning, that I am means to be, to exist, to always be in existence. Jesus is declaring himself to be Yahweh. As a matter of fact, in John 8, 58, he says to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. They understood that as a claim to deity. As a matter of fact, they desired to stone him as a result of that. Interestingly enough, the word I am means, in Greek, it's ego, emi, or am I, or me, actually. See, Jesus is declaring himself to be the always existent one, making himself equal with God, declaring himself to be God. This is why the Jews, as I stated, wanted to stone him. Now, we see that God is omniscient. Omniscient is a, is a fancy way of saying that God knows everything. We don't know everything, but God does. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah 46, 9, up on the board, God alone is able to declare the end from the beginning. Hebrews 4, 13 says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him, to whom we must give an account. God knows everything. Nothing that you do is hidden from God, good or bad. So God knows those good deeds that you do. You don't need to parade it with neon signs, but he also knows the bad things we do. That's why we confess. But also God is omnipresent. God is omnipresent. Psalm 139, verse 7 specifically, but actually verses 7 through 12, if you want to read that on your own sometime. But in verse 7, it says, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? We can't flee from God if we go to the depths of the sea or to the highest mountains. God is there. He's everywhere. But he's also omnipotent. Omnipotent. Turn with me to Daniel 4.35, please. Daniel 4.35. And while you're turning there, Psalm 24.8 says, The Lord mighty, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. It is God who fights the battles for you. Knowing that he is all powerful, know, knowing that gives you comfort and confidence that whatever you're facing, I don't care what the battle is, if it's a physical or spiritual battle, God is all powerful. He is omnipotent. Praise God. But Daniel understood this too in Daniel 4.35. It says in Daniel 4.35, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will. In the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? See, no force on earth and no power in hell can thwart the purpose or plan of God. He is all powerful. You ought to take comfort in that because that helps you in your personal walk. You have those divine resources at your fingertip. But also God is immutable. Immutable is a way of saying he does not change. You know, that's important because why on earth do we talk about Abraham and how God interacted with Abraham? Some people, especially teenagers, might say, who cares? Those guys are all dead. Why do I care? What do I care about some guy who lived 2,000 years ago? Let me tell you why. Because God doesn't change. How he acted with Abraham, that character that he showed, the fact that he keeps his promises to Israel, the fact that he kept his promises in the Old Testament, the fact that he lifted up people in the Old, time, in, in Old Testament times, he picked them up when they were low. Guess what? That character doesn't change. He's immutable. Amen. That means he, that divine resource is available to you. That's why we hold on to promises like Hebrews 13, 8, that says Jesus is, Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you look at those Old Testament promises and say, God, you loved Abraham like that. I know you love me like that. Praise God. Malachi 3.6 says, Jesus, or God saying, for I am the Lord, I do not change. But we also see that God is gracious. 
Psalm 145, 8 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Aren't you glad that for God so loved the world he gave his only son? You know, this is all grace. Ephesians 2, 8 is talking about grace being a gift from God. That grace is a gift. But also God is faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13. Do you realize 2 2.13 says in, in 2 Timothy 2.13, it says, if we're faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. See, he showed that same character. You'll see on the screen, Deuteronomy 7.9, he was faithful to Israel. Israel was unfaithful. And so he is faithful to you. And he loves you. That kind of knowledge of his faithfulness and his grace doesn't give you a license to sin. People say that all the time. They say, I don't like free grace. Why? Because it means you get saved and you can live like the devil. Well, no, but there are consequences and reward. There is a price to pay, as he said. You might, God sometimes puts people to death or, you know, the sin that leads to death, whatever that is. Or sometimes people are sick because they take the word of God lightly. Or they, they, they just trample on God's mercy and grace. But he never stops loving you. Right. It doesn't diminish his faithfulness to you even when you're faithless. And I am faithless. But we also see that God is just. You know, again, in Old Testament, it says he is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Do you know that everybody's talking about social justice today? Do you know we won't find social justice in government or in community actions and in protests? You can throw all the stones you want, but justice comes from God. He is just. Amen. There is no injustice in him. And someday, someday in his kingdom, there will be no injustice. And all will be made right. Yes. But God is also merciful. We're not going to turn there. I don't have it in my on my slide. But Romans 9, 15 through 16, God says to Moses, he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. God is merciful. Do you know, you've heard it said, grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. I don't want what I deserve when you watch those commercials. Call 1-800-THIS. Call now and get what you deserve. I'm like, I don't want what I deserve. I'll pass. <laughs> God is wise. Yes. Romans 11:33. All oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Amen. So, why did I take so much time on this first one? Cuz let me tell you why. Because if the first one isn't right, none of it's right. That's the foundation of John 3, 16. When you build a house, if the foundation is screwed up, the house is going to topple. Well, this verse stands on the first two words, for God. Amen. We ought to fear him. When I say fear him, I mean reverence him. For he is holy. How does this affect me on a daily basis? I hope that you take home with you the fact that he is holy, that he is righteous. That he is just. So if you've been treated unjustly this week, don't worry about it. God sees it. We already saw that. He will write those that things that are wrong. Maybe we won't see it in our lifetime, but there is a day coming. Praise God. So the other thing is, if he keeps those promises, guess what? He's going to keep the promise to you for the free gift of eternal life. So the second thing we see is the greatest motive. For God so loved, stop there. For God so loved. Do you know the New Testament sense of agape? That's what that word is. It means a volitional love as opposed to a, an emotional kind. The problem with people when they get married nowadays, they their, their emotions are attached to what they think is love. 
love hates this. We quote the great uh, theologian Tina Turner. What's love got to do with that? <laughs> That's the last time he's asking me to talk here. But it's the wrong kind of love. Because Tina Turner is actually right. What's love got to do with it if you're talking about that kind of love? That's the kind of love, as soon as stuff goes sideways, you're gone. This kind of love is a volitional love. You choose, no matter what, to stay with that person. And that's the kind of love that God shows you. It's not just a, an emotional kind, it's self-sacrificing. It's a agape love. It's the highest form. I love that type of love. We see 1 John 4.19. Do you realize when we look at the highest form of love? I just want you to understand something about that. And that is this. When we love like Jesus loved, do you know what that means? That means we, that's the kind of love that says, I prefer volitionally, volitionally, I'm choosing to live my life through Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm choosing to make the choices that he would make. I'm choosing to obey the word of God, not because I have to, but because I volitionally, of my own free will, choose to do so through his power. That's what, that's the kind of love. So if he loves us that way, he empowers us to love him that way, and our spouses that way, and our children, and our enemies that way. First John 4, 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. So in other words, we couldn't love like that, the agape love, without him first loving us. Amen. So what I'm getting at is it emanates from him. If you, don't, if you have trouble loving your spouse, your friend, your neighbor, I would ask you to go back and ask yourself, how does God love me? And then go and do likewise. Right. Amen. For, for, turn to 1 John 4, 8. 4, 8. And by, while you're turning there, I put it up on the board there. It's a provocative statement, but I want you to listen to this. God doesn't love us because we're valuable. Let me say it again. God doesn't love us because we're valuable. Guess what? We're valuable because God loves us. That means it's all about Jesus Christ. Amen. That's where our love emanates from. If you're having trouble loving somebody, I would ask, do you love Jesus enough? Are you focusing on his love for you? God is love, according to, this is the latter part of verse 8. God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. That God, was, God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That reinforces what I was just saying. First Peter 4, 8 says, And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Amen. Amen. Don't be concerned if you have trouble and struggle with that, because I do. We all struggle with that, but this is why we have teachings like this to remind us of who we are in yes. Jesus. So that brings us to the third greatest truth in the greatest verse of the greatest book. And that is the greatest object for God so loved the world. You know, that's all humanity. Every person, every human being, past, present, and future that will ever live. All the world means all. All means all. Amen. This refutes Calvinism. Calvinism crumbles under that doctrine. First John 2 8 says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those only at West Side Baptist. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I didn't have for the whole world. Hebrews 2 9 says, For by grace of God, by the grace of God, that Jesus Christ might taste death for everyone. Romans 3 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ 
to all and on all who, and there's the condition, believe. For there is no difference. He's not a respecter of persons. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. That brings us to our fourth greatest truth. For God so loved the world that he gave. Do you know the story of the Bible? I have it up there. The story of the Bible is what God did for man, not what man does for God. It's not about that. It's about him for his glory. So what did God do for us? You know, what have you done for me lately, God? I mean, I don't know. Sometimes you might think that in a moment of weakness. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3. Okay, Galatians chapter 1, verse 3. Peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave. What did he give? He gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. You have the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in you. If you sin, you sin because you choose to sin. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, yes, the fact that he gave himself, I put up here on the screen that the price was his precious, sinless blood. Gave is a transitive verb. It's a fancy way of saying that, that the gift directly is a gift directly from God. In other words, a transitive verb means that that gift comes directly from the object, which is Jesus Christ. It comes from him. Amen. Luke 21, 4. I love that story about the, uh, the widow and the two mites. Jesus says to his, to his disciples, for they all out of their surplus put into the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had. See, to us, we look at the what instead of the why. God's word says it's not the what. It's the why you give, not the what you give. Amen. Why do you give? The fact that he has given so much for us, that ought to be motivation for us. You know what that ought to motivate us to do? That ought to motivate, so he gave me. So how can I give? Well, I can give myself to Bible study. I can give myself to prayer. I can give myself to serving other people or exercising my gifts, talents, and abilities. That's all I can give. Do you realize sacrificial giving is the most Christ-like thing you can do? Amen. It's not as an act. Like We're not trying to pay God. We're not saying, okay, God, I'm going to pay you back. You did for me. You paid for the dinner. I'm going to leave the tip. <laughs> but it's... <laughs> I got that from somebody else. But it's it's out of appreciation for what he has done for us. Like, I'm just so grateful. That leads us to the number five greatest truth. Number five of the greatest truths is, is what God gave us. What did he give us? He gave us the greatest gift. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. One of a kind. I put up on the screen, only begotten is monogenes. It's two Greek words. It basically means it's the only of its kind. Nothing exists like the only begotten son. Right. People say, well, yeah, but only begotten son, that means God begot God. That means Jesus had a beginning. It doesn't have to mean that. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews eleven seventeen, it talks about Abraham. It talks about Isaac being Abraham's only begotten son. He was. He had Ishmael. Ishmael. So it has nothing to do with birth. It has to do with position. That's right. One of a kind. Isaac was one of a kind in the sense of the genealogy for Christ. But Jesus Christ is the unique son of God. Right. The greatest gift, God's only begotten son, paid our sin debt. 
Praise God for that. Turn with me to John chapter 19, verse 28. John chapter 19, verse 28. Because I love this verse, and I'll tell you what it has to do with Jesus Christ being one of a kind. Because there is only one who could do what Jesus Christ did. One and no other. John chapter 19, verse 28. John chapter 19, verse 28 says the following. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. <laughs> Bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. I want you to understand, it is finished, it's to tell side. It's one word in the Greek. You know what it means? It means paid in full. All right? He paid. You don't have to leave the tell. He paid. Praise God. It's in the perfect tense, by the way, which means it's a one-time action with ongoing results. That's what it means. You know, we think about, uh, we think about believers in the past. Believers in the past, like Abraham. It says in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was accredited him for righteousness. In case you're ever wondering, credit him for righteousness, it's like the benefit came before the payment. It's like when you go to the store, hopefully not too much this Christmas season, and you charge something, you get the benefit, but you don't got to, the payment ain't been made yet. Jesus Christ is the payment. Yes. For that sin. So, everything that he did when he said it is finished, it was sufficient for all of mankind, past, present, and future. Amen. Praise Amen. God. That brings us to the greatest truth number six, and that is the greatest invitation that has ever been issued. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever Turn with me to John 5, 24. John 5, 24. Turn with me, please, because I want you to see this word. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whoever, that means any of you, I don't care what you did in the past. I don't care if you killed somebody. I don't care if you fill in the blank, the nasty nine, the dirty dozen, the sleazy six, you know, Whatever they are, I don't know what they are, but John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed, past tense, from death to life. You know, you all pass from death to life. Now, I don't care what you did. The world does. You have three enemies. You have the you have Satan. He'll accuse you. You have the world that will accuse you. Hey, I remember you back in the day. I was with you when we robbed that store or we we did this when you cheated on your wife, whatever it is. So you have the enemy, Satan. You have the world. And then you have the flesh. Those three things are always accusing you. But the truth is the word of God, not what you feel and your emotions, because they come and go. The only thing that matters is what does the word of God say? I don't mean to sound angry. It's just frustrating because I struggle with that. I get so frustrated because sometimes knowing what I know, I need somebody to remind me. So John 3.36 says, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Do you know that Titus 2.11 says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. All men. And, and, and then that means women. Dang, it's <laughs> First Timothy, let me just jump down to verse 4. I have it high. I don't have it highlighted on there, but verse four on your board there says, 
Whoever de who desires, this is talking about God, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus Christ is our mediator between God and man. He desires that we all, that all are saved. Revelation 22, 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come! And let him who hears come! And let him who thirsts come! Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. There is no cost. Do you know that before we move on, that man was created in God's image. Amen. Why is that matter? Well, because man has volition. Matter of fact, Genesis 1 26 says, let us make man in our image. Do you know that we are image bearers of God? Right. You have a choice to make. You can choose. God has given us that ability. And that brings us to the, to, to number seven. By the way, this is not a two-step process. But the greatest decision is to allow yourself to be convinced that this is true. Okay? Let me repeat that. The greatest decision is to allow yourself to be convinced that this is true. In other words, that's a way of saying belief. Okay? It's a one-step process. It's not two-step. So what does it mean to believe? So I believe you. As I put up on the board... 99% being convinced is not saving faith. And you go, oh, no, wait a minute. Yesterday, I had 99% faith. Yeah, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're focusing on John 3.16. At that moment, you heard the gospel. Were you 100% convinced that it was true? If you were, you're saved. If you were 99% convinced, you're not saved. Okay, but... The next day, if you wake up and go, oh, man, I'm only 99% convinced now. Guess what? You're still saved. It's one point in time where you're 100% convinced. Because my faith wavers. And if you say yours don't, then you need to first John 1 9, take that spiritual bath. Okay? Because my faith wavers, and I guarantee you yours does too. So none of us live in 100% faith, like, oh, yeah, praise God. Yes. You know, it doesn't matter what's going on. We all doubt at times. Believe is the one and only condition by which you obtain eternal life. Amen. You know, it means to be persuaded, to affirm that something is true or have confidence in that. That's what it means. It comes from the Greek word, pastuo. Do you realize that we have to make these decisions alone? Do you realize that your mother and father cannot make it? We have a couple teens here. They're at that age. Where in the Hebrew culture, they have to decide. Mom and dad can't. Grandparents can't. You know, God doesn't have any grandchildren. That's right. That's right. That means it's a personal thing. You have to make that decision. So John uses that word a hundred times, nearly a hundred times. It's the most important question. So are you going to believe? Are you going to trust him? That's the eternal benefits of believing in Jesus. It's a one-time act with eternal benefits. John 6, 47 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me will have everlasting life. Oh, he caught it. Has everlasting life. Present possession. Not in the future, pie in the sky when you die. It's now. You have eternal life. That brings us to number eight. And that is the greatest person in history. Now, these rest of these are shorter, so don't, don't be alarmed. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes. Now, what the next words are are very important because the object of your faith is ever. Believes in him. Jesus is the greatest person in history. History is his story. Amen. The Bible is about Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation. It's not about works, not about religion. Turn with me to Acts 4.12. Acts 4.12. Acts 4.12. While you're turning there, Jesus says in John 14.6, I am the way the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you realize it's an exclusive faith? It's exclusive. There is no other way. I know that there are talk show hosts that go, yeah, there's a lot of ways. Jesus Christ says the definite article, I am the way, the truth, the life. That's it. No exceptions. Acts 4.12 says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Praise God. 1 Timothy 2.5 up on the board here says, and for there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That brings us to the greatest truth number nine. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Do you realize we're saved from the penalty of sin? What is penalty of sin? It's eternal death. Eternal death means, death, by the way, means separation. Do you realize when you sin, you have invited death into your walk with Christ? That's right. Because it's separation of fellowship, not sonship. But you have separated. You have killed that fellowship. You have brought death into it. But the good news is that positionally we will never perish. Amen. Shall not in the Greek means that it's completely ruled out. To perish, as I stated, means to be in a conscious state of torment. That's what perish means. As a matter of fact, I have it up here, Revelation 14, 11. Look on the border, look it in the Bible. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. You are delivered, and you shall never perish. You will never face this. I don't care if you go home and you live like the devil. I'm not suggesting it. But I'm saying... You know what this does for me? It doesn't make me want to sin. It makes me not want to sin. Amen. So we see, I have Revelation 20. Uh, actually, I'm just going to read the latter part. The death and hell are cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. See, that's the condition of unbelieving people in the world. They are lost. And we also see the 10th greatest truth. That's the greatest contrast that the world has ever known. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. But that's the greatest contrast the world has ever known. Because we're talking about eternal life versus eternal damnation. That's what we're talking about here. John 3.18 says, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Do you want to see a further example of this? I have it in Romans 6, 23. Here's a look at the contrast. For the wages of sin is death. So there's the bad thing, but here's the contrast. The free gift of eternal life or the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at the contrast. It's amazing. It's not a one or other, by the way. I mean, you can't have both. Everyone has to choose. This is a contrast. That brings us to our 11th. And with that, we're almost finished. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have. This is, the, this is number 11. The greatest truth is the greatest assurance. That is have. Do you realize John 10, 28? It says... And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. I call that the double grip of grace. You are held in the double grip of grace. God the Father, God the Son, they got you. You can't escape. I have a quote in here from Dan Wallace in his Greek grammar. It's kind of lengthy, but I'd like to read it. Because I really want you to pay attention. You can read up on the board. In Dan Wallace's Greek grammar, he comments on this construction. And he says, emphatic negation is indicated by omon plus the aorist subjunctive. This is the strongest way 
to negate something in Greek. Oman rules out even the idea as being a possibility. Matter of fact, he says it's the most indecisive way of negating something in the future, as well as soteriological theme. In other words, salvation theme is frequently found in such statements, especially in John. What is negated is the possibility of the loss of salvation. He is saying that the Greek construction makes once saved and then you aren't saved as impossible, and it cannot happen. In other words, the Greek doesn't allow it. You can't unsave yourself. Right. Well, you didn't see me last Saturday. No, I didn't. But I know if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a present possession. It can't be lost. Take heart in that. Okay, so John, 1 John 5.13. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So that's why he, John's writing. He wants you to be assured, walk in confidence. Amen. But then that brings us to what I call the triple grip of grace. We're not just held in a double grip. It's like wrestling, WW, whatever it is. Something. Like I'm not in a double grip. I'm in a triple grip. I can't get out, even if I wanted to. Like I tried to get out, but God said I got one more hand on. Ephesians 1 13 to 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, these are believers, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance to the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. You know what that means? When you go to buy a house, you give earnest money. That shows that you want that house, all right? God said, I'm going to give you a down payment installment. It's the Holy Spirit to seal you when? Till to, to, to you sin? No, to the day of redemption of the purchased possession. You're the purchased possession. Triple grip of grace, number 12. The greatest truth in the greatest book of the greatest verse is the greatest promise. And that's what it is, the greatest promise. Yes. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting. Let's stop there. Let's separate us from life for a minute. See, eternal death is what you deserve. I know, because that's what I deserve. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Do you realize that we have all fallen short? But... We see that God has given us eternal life in John 5, 11, And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. So how long is eternal life? That's a good question. I don't know. Well, you know what? I do know. Eternal life is beyond time. It's beyond our understanding. Do you realize that eternal life is not static? It's not something you can measure. Right. Okay. We are finite beings. We live in time. Eternal life is far beyond time. It is something we can't quantify. It's a quality as well as quantity. That's something that we need to remember. That brings us to our 13th and final. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting, that means Always lasting beyond time, the greatest possession. That's the 13th greatest truth. It is the greatest possession. I don't care how rich you are, and I don't care how poor you are in the world's eyes. If you have eternal life, you are the wealthiest human being in the world. Dare I say that Elon Musk may be the poorest man in the world yes. if, he's, if he's never believed in Jesus for eternal life. I don't know that, so I don't know. But without eternal life, you can't know God in a personal way. It's impossible. And you know, that's the thing I want you to understand. Turn with me. This is our last scripture we're turning to, John 17, 3. Please, I really want you to see this, and I really appreciate you bearing with me, okay? Because I don't know how long I was allowed to run, but this is going to be about 50 minutes. So, um we don't have a, a stopwatch coming in. Yeah. But 
John 17, 3. And this is eternal life. Look at this. That you may know, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is the greatest thing you could ever possess. Remember, I told you that. But John 10, 10 says, I have come. He says, the thief has come to kill, steal, and destroy that I have come, that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The reason I want you to talk about, I, I want to talk about this is because this is not just about not going to hell. That's not what it's just, it's not what it's talking about, okay? The reason I bring this up is because it's far greater than that. Do you realize that apart from eternal life, you cannot know God? Do you know what the Bible means when it uses the word no? Oftentimes that word is used between a man and a woman, a man knowing a woman in, in, in a sexual relationship. Okay, that's right. So it's talking about intimacy. Do you know that you can know God in an intimate way? That's part of having eternal life is the ability to know God in an intimate way that unbelievers can never know. They can know their, they might get an inkling there's a God by the things they see around them, but they can't know God in an intimate way. I say this because it is, it is a, not just a future gift, but it is a present possession. So in closing and in summation, you have the ability to be intimate with Jesus today. You have that ability. Has sin barred you from that? Have your three enemies attacked you today? The enemy, the Satan, the world, or your flesh? Is it keeping you? Are you believing that instead of John 3, 16 and the promise that he has provided? If you're believing that, you're always going to be defeated. But if you're... If you would just believe the word of God, you will be free and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So the greatest verse in the greatest book, the Bible, is a message of freedom. It's a message of hope. It's a message of encouragement. But most importantly, it fulfills your purpose for being here on earth. Do you know what your purpose is? Because, you know, you can't as a church, you should have a goal, a mission statement, you know, like. Or you should, as a business, they have certain things. They Do you know what your mission statement is for life? It's to bring glory to God. Amen. And do you know that you'll fulfill your purpose if you do that? If you, if you stand on his promises. Anything else, by the way, you're living a lie and you're living below your pay grade. Amen. Amen. I, uh, that's it. I'm gonna. I, I, I'm sure you want to uh, say a closing prayer, but uh, I would just like to pray, and then I'm. Uh, I'll be finished. Father, thank you for the time to spend together in your word. God, I pray that you would establish each and every one of us in the truth of your word, and not in the falsehoods, lies, or manipulations that come at, uh, against us in the world. Father, I pray that you would hedge us in and keep us from the evil. I thank you, God, for the opportunity to gather into your house and worship through the word, and most importantly, Lord. And in this prayer, I want to thank you for my family at Westside, the precious people that you have loved me through, that you have loved me through them. You have encouraged me through them. And I'm so grateful for them. And I just ask for your blessing on each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Westside. Praise God. Say amen, church. <laughs> what a mighty God we serve. For the sake of time, we won't uh, we won't sing, but let's stand. And uh, Keith, you've got closing prayer. I commend you now to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and peace be with you. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 And thank you, Pastor Barry. Come and close this. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for Pastor Barry's uh, heart. Um, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you so much, Lord, that he 
He's worked so hard to teach us your word this morning, Lord. And may you uh, bless us on our way homes and uh, bless the meals to come, Lord. But most of all, we thank you for that great gift of John 3.16, Lord. For it's in yeah. Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 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 God bless the church. See you Sunday. And uh, as you say goodbye, dear.